It's been a big year for livestock. I mean, we've been hearing all about crops, but it's been a pretty good year for livestock industries as well. Uh, relief from drought and solid farm income growth are providing the cattle and sheep industries um, a chance to rebuild their herds and flocks after a, a few years of really challenging conditions. But going forward, it's not, it's not all plain sailing. We're looking at some pretty hot weather in the next uh, few months in many regions. Um, we're hearing about difficulties that processors are facing um, in sourcing cattle and that's, and that's driving prices above what some of our export customers uh, want to pay. Competition in our export markets is a major issue and remaining competitive is key but um, yeah, we need a productivity boost in the face of prices easing over the medium to longer term. So uh, here's, a, here's an outline of... Um, what I'm going to be covering in my, in my talk today. Useful rainfall in the, in the south and an excellent wet season in the north are giving producers a chance, as I said, to rebuild their livestock numbers in earnest. And it's that restocker demand that's been driving prices up. And I'll talk a little bit about how long that might last. Um, and farm incomes for cattle and sheep producers. 2016-17 is delivering another strong result on the back of a very good year last year. And over the medium term, we expect that meat production and exports will recover from the current long, uh, low levels. But our, our export outlook is affected by increasing competition. So with that, I want to take you through some modelling results we've released looking at competition with South American beef. And in doing so, I'll also touch on a few other related issues such as the value chain and innovation to improve our, our productivity and competitiveness. But first up, um, let's have a look at our cattle prices. So we can see here that cattle prices climbed pretty solidly for two years leading up to spring last year. Young cattle, represented by the yearling indicator there, and, uh, and heavy cattle, represented by the Japox indicator, had increased by more than 70% over that two-year period. Um, cow prices also rose strongly by, by 60%. And this was despite significant uh, turnoff as persistent dry conditions, particularly uh, in, in Queensland, um, led producers to sell cattle that they just couldn't carry. Strong export demand and a depreciating dollar supported uh, prices of heavier cattle and cows, even though slaughter was increasing at the time. And with the useful rainfall that was being received in the, in the southern regions in spring last year, demand rose for young cattle for restocking. And with a good wet season in the north of Australia arriving, herd rebuilding intensified and young cattle prices climbed higher. So I'm just going to remove cows from this slide now. And if we concentrate just on this recent period, we can see clearly a, di a divergence, a, a gap. Export demand for heavy cattle is still strong historically, but it's no longer climbing. But there's still very strong demand for young cattle, for restocking and for feedlots and for, for live exports. So that gap has, has been increasing recently. Eventually, these two indicators will come together again as they usually do. They usually track each other fairly closely. And we've seen this before. Uh, after the millennium drought, the indicators started to diverge in the autumn of 2010 when some useful rains were being received down south and really took off after a good wet season um, in the north, again after a couple of missed wet seasons. This divergence lasted for about three years, so this might give us a clue as to how long the, the current episode is likely to last. We're two years into it now, so we expect probably that by the time, um, this time next year, we'll see those prices converge again and start to track each other again. The short-term outlook, though, is for a dry autumn in the eastern states, so we will see some more young cattle coming onto the market, and that may bring prices down a bit. I think that's starting, starting now, but the underlying supply constraints um, remain. But... What about farm cash incomes, farm incomes in this market? Here are some results from the latest ABARES farm survey. In 14-15, with the highest cattle turnoff in 36 years, average farm cash incomes for beef, in, uh, beef producers increased by 70%. And they increased a further 70% in 15-16, even though turnoff for slaughter was coming down. 
prices were climbing pretty sharply, and that was mainly because of that strong restocker demand. In 1617, the year that we're currently in, we're projecting that incomes will increase again with uh, slightly higher prices, offsetting the effects of reduced slaughter this year. I'll overlay sheep here. Sheep producers are also expecting a strong result through higher prices for lamb, sheep and wool and through increased numbers sold. In 1516, farm cash incomes of sheep industry farms actually declined and that was mainly because of lower wool production. But in 1617, higher wool prices and lamb prices are expected to result in farm cash incomes, which are around 70% above the average for the past 10 years. So these look like the best results for a long time, but is it the case if we looked at a longer time series? And for beef, for example, is it the case if we look at the whole industry? Um, we'll look at the, the difference between northern and, and southern Australia for beef here. Farm cash incomes for cattle producers in southern Australia in the past two years have been the highest in at least the 40 years shown here. Um, but for northern Australia, farm cash incomes um, were still below that recorded in the early 2000s and less than in the late 1970s. And all of this is in, um, in measured in today's dollars, so adjusted for inflation. Um, the extended dry conditions in Queensland over the previous few years would have been a major factor in the north falling short of reaching records like the south has. The cost of restocking, uh, of course, is very high and for breeders, um, breeding enterprises, of course, it just takes, takes um, some time and foregone cash flow. So that's limiting the extent of those, those cash income rises for northern producers. So um, I want to look here again at our prices and, and our medium term outlook. Um, and you can see in this slide how sale yard prices increased as, as slaughter decreased this year and last year. Two years ago, um, the average weighted sale yard price for cattle um, averaged 364 cents a kilogram dressed weight. This year, they're averaging 540 cents a kilogram, nearly, nearly another um, $2. So going forward, as cattle supplies increase and restocking pressure um, recedes, uh, we expect slaughter and production will start to rise again slowly and prices therefore will ease in real terms over, over the next five years and we're projecting to around 465 cents a kilo. Eventually numbers will have built up sufficiently to see slaughter rise again to just under 9 million head by 21-22, that's our projection. And that's 17% above uh, the 16-17 low point. Now sheep and lamb prices of course have been climbing also for the past few years. The lamb sale yard price is forecast to average 8% higher this year at 585 cents a kilo. And next year continued flock rebuilding, strong export demand um, are expected to support prices around this level. But over the remainder of the outlook, uh, we do expect those prices to come back down a bit as slaughter increases to an historically high um, 25 million head by the end of our projection period. For adult sheep, slaughter is projected to remain relatively low. And that's as um, flocks continue to expand and that's buoyed by the um, strong demand for lamb and improved wool demand. For both, both beef and uh, sheep industries, import, uh, exports are very important. Um, they account for nearly 70% of production for beef and uh, nearly 60% of lamb production. But in most of our markets, we are facing increasing competition. And we heard this morning from the USDA's Deputy Chief Economist um, about the US's recovering beef production and increasing focus on export markets. And this will affect demand for Australian beef in the United States, but also uh, in Japan and Korea, high value markets for us. But we're also facing increasing competition from South American exporters who are, who are now gaining access to markets that previously were inaccessible to them. So this and the following couple of slides present information from a, a study that we've recently re released just before Christmas on South America's emergence as a strong competitor to Australian beef. So it's, it's available on our website. 
Beef is uh, an important agricultural export for both Australia and South America. Combined, they account for almost half of the world's trade in beef. As global demand for beef expands over the next several decades, um, there will be significant export opportunities, particularly in Asia. Um, South America is increasingly well positioned to compete in those markets and has been doing so for the past 10 to 15 years, as, as you can see at the, the, um, the, blue, the blue bars there. Um, Investments in their industries have led to improvements in production efficiency, disease management, and supply chain traceability. And that's resulting in significant production and export growth, um, particularly in Brazil, as you can see in this slide. In 2030, uh, we're projecting that the total value of Australian exports will increase, but not necessarily to all of our export markets. Our share of imports into China, um, Hong Kong, ASEAN region uh, increases in our projections, but in other markets, our share declines. And that's not only because of increasing competition from South America in Europe and North America, but also in North Asia from um, Northern American exports. Another feature of this South American study is where we tried to get a better understanding of what was actually driving past growth in beef exports, a decomposition analysis, if you like. Um, see the figures there, Australia's beef exports increased from 2.8 billion in, in uh, 2000 to 7 billion in 2014 um, in US dollars. And that's 150% over that 14 year period. We decomposed that growth into these four factors here. Improved market access explained 88% of that export growth. And this reflects our reputation as a consistent provider of high quality beef and our avoidance of animal disease issues like FMD and BSE, of course. We gained um, when other countries suffered embargoes and bans from those diseases. Also free trade agreements over that time with the United States and ASEAN uh, countries lowered tariff rates for us and expanded quotas for, for beef exports. So market access is a very important factor for our growth in exports. Another factor is export supply costs. And, and by export supply costs, this, it represents a range of costs from on farm through right through the chain to arrival at port for export. For Australia, lower export supply costs accounted for 26% of our beef export growth. Around half of that was mainly um, from farmers reducing their unit cost of production on farm and the other half from rising costs in competing countries adding positively to growth in Australia's exports. Rising global incomes also um, led to higher import demand and that's accounted for 8% of export growth and also appreciation of the Australian dollar over the period provided an offsetting negative 22%. That's up to 2014, remember, since then the dollar has come down. Um, if we overlay Brazil's results, we can again see that improved market access is the most important driver, explaining 55% of Brazil's growth. Um, for example, uh, um, access to the Middle East and expanded access to other South American countries through um, Mercosur and, and related agreements. But lower supply costs accounted for well over a third of Brazil's export growth. And this factor was, was larger for Brazil than any other countries analysed. Strong productivity growth from the factors that I mentioned earlier resulted in a significant um, decline in real export costs and, and that in turn has led to stronger um, exports. Brazil now does compete with Australia in some lower value markets. Renewed access to China, of course, has led to increases in Brazil's share of that market since late 2015. And in 2016, Brazil regained access to the United States market. So while that's all pretty challenging, um, there are um, some potential constraints to their future growth. They, they'll need to um, maintain or retain their, their lower cost of production relative to other exporters and, and continue to improve their market access. And also cost-wise, I mean, um, inadequate transport infrastructure um, 
uh, may put upward pressure on export costs and there's also high demand uh, for land from alternative uses. But Australia also needs to invest on both on-farm and off-farm productivity growth to remain uh, price competitive. As we know, our, our la labour and energy costs are high compared with other countries. And we also need to ensure that there are no inappropriate hurdles to consolidation, which have, of course has been a feature of our meat processing sector for many decades. So going forward and hunting for that step change in uh, productivity growth to lower our costs throughout the supply chain and increase profitability of our industry, a range of innovations are being developed and taken up. There's a list here of just an interesting few of them. The first few, the first four or so, are at the farm level. The last few are at the processor level. Um, big data analytics um, in the middle can benefit all, all players in the supply chain. So we're going to hear soon from our, our panel from Anna and James about how data and online applications are being harnessed in their spheres of work. So I won't say any more about these and, and Mick may touch on some talking, uh, in talking about the ACCC report that is just released uh, yesterday, those findings. So I just want to finish up with, um, um, yeah, we have challenges ahead. Um, it's a great year, uh, bank it. <laughs> but as global beef demand increases, um, there will be opportunities for, for exporters, but all parts in the supply chain need to continue to invest um, to improve productivity in order to remain price competitive. We need to continue to prioritise our, our efforts to negotiate trade agreements and maintain trade relationships that support access for Australian product. And we need to maintain our production systems that ensure our status as a sustainable, disease-free livestock and meat producer, um, distinguishing ourselves on quality. Thanks.